Fellowship Live, Church of the Living Word. The, the Living, Living Word, Word with Pastor, Pastor Terry Kern. Greetings, my name is Pastor John Hansen, and I welcome you to this broadcast of The Living Word with Pastor Terry Kern, a ministry of Truth Fellowship Live. Truth Fellowship Live is a new church in the Bismarck community located at 1020 South 12th Street, just south of Cashwise Foods. Truth Fellowship Live conducts ministries directed toward evangelizing the lost, training those who trust in Christ to do the work of the ministry, and developing Christ-centered leaders in the community. Our fellowship emphasizes the careful and straightforward teaching of the Bible as the true and inherent Word of God. Truth Fellowship Live maintains a free grace outlook, which means we strongly hold to the doctrine that salvation is by faith alone. To that end, we believe in the importance of studying and obeying the Word of God. People today believe many things regarding what it means to be a Christian, but the Bible is very clear that the only way to eternal life is by trusting in Christ alone for salvation. The Bible says that all people are separated from God through disobedience. The Bible terms this sin. We are all guilty before God because of sin, and we are condemned to eternal death. But the Bible also says that Jesus Christ died for those sins. Christ has paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. By trusting in Him alone, we receive eternal life. Please join me as we study the Word of God together with Pastor Terry. morning everyone so good to see you here this morning and God has brought us through a another week and uh, brought us back together that's good to see I want to welcome all of you who are joining us uh, online and uh, via television as well and uh, thank you for joining us and encourage you that uh, if you have the opportunity to uh, make it to uh, be with us here at Truth Fellowship Live. Uh, you, uh, I, I, I am firmly convinced that you will not be disappointed uh, and uh, that you will have a great experience like I always do at Truth Fellowship Live. I, I, uh, I just love our time together of uh, fellowship, prayer together, worship through music, uh, and, uh, and then uh, just enjoying the, the time together uh, as, a, as a church family. So I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, if, uh, if you don't have a copy of the sermon outline, I would encourage you to get one of those in front of you as well. Uh, I think uh, that it is available online, so if you're watching uh, electronically or uh, don't know about the television broadcast. Uh, are they, do they have access? They can go online to get the uh, to get the outline if uh, if they're watching via television. So, uh, and that's truthfellowshiplive.com uh, where you would go for that. All right. Well, um, Hurricane Harvey, huh? <laughs> um, we lived in Texas for a while, uh, never in Houston. Uh, visited down at Corpus Christi a, a couple of times and uh, love that area. But uh, Hurricane Harvey has uh, truly devastated the east coast of Texas. I am sure you all know that uh, by now that this is the largest storm rainfall totals uh, in the lower 48 states ever. Um, there is um, there are a number of numbers floating around, but uh, I the one I'm seeing quite regularly is that there were 51.9 inches of rain that fell in this one storm system. There's only one recorded rainfall total that has ever been greater, and that was greater by one tenth of an inch. <laughs> that was in Kauai, Hawaii, uh, uh, in 1950. 
there was a 52-inch rainfall. But uh, Hurricane Harvey is clearly the hugest storm ever to invade a highly populated, heavily developed and industrialized area uh, in the history of the United States of America. And that's well over four feet of water. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Four feet of water? Uh, think about what, how devastating it would be if we got a four-foot snowfall and how hard that would be to deal with four feet of snow. Uh, this is four feet of water. Uh, over nine trillion gallons of water fell in that area. <laughs> uh, in that hurricane. What a storm. What, a, what an amazing storm. Those folks truly need our prayers. And uh, if we can do it, uh, help, support, with the cleanup efforts, it must be completely overwhelming. I, I, I just, my heart goes out to them. But here, a little over 2,000 miles away, uh, we're high and dry. Uh, 200 miles away, uh, unaffected by Hurricane Harvey. Uh, even as little as 50 miles uh, to the southeast of Corpus Christi, uh, they got some rain, but nothing unusual, uh, nothing amazing. Uh, and I think, as I, as I try to put this in context, it's important for us to remember there was another storm in history that, uh, that was much greater than, uh, than this one, uh, where the entire world, can you, can you even think about this? I mean, can we even have any kind of mental capacity to grasp the idea that the entire earth is covered, not in a few feet of water, but in hundreds and even thousands of feet of water. Um, something like this uh, should certainly turn our thoughts and attention to the Scriptures. And, uh, and we ought to be overwhelmingly, I think, sobered by the power and the wonder of God's hand. You know, the Scriptures uh, continually talk about it. It actually occurs a couple of times in the passage we're studying in Isaiah in Sunday school, but uh, the imagery of the arm of the Lord uh, and obviously talking about His power. Uh, Elohim is the plural name for God. Uh, the Hebrew, it's Hebrew plural. Um, but it's a plural name used of the triune Godhead. It's used actually 2,350 times of the Lord in the Old Testament. Uh, it's His name uh, that emph especially emphasizes His greatness and His power and His splendor and His majesty. And uh, that was certainly on display in, uh, in Hurricane Harvey, uh, certainly on display in the flood. Uh, that covered the entire earth. And Elohim promised that he was never ever again going to destroy the entire earth by flooding it with water. Remember uh, the symbol he gave us to remember uh, his promise, the symbol of the rainbow. Uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's incredible now that many people who deny God's power, deny his very existence, have tried to co-opt the rainbow as their symbol, I can't even imagine the shock that awaits people uh, when they have foolishly denied the power of God and the judgment of God that He will someday bring upon the whole earth for unbelief and rebellion against Him and His absolute power, His absolute authority over all the earth. It is... Uh, it is so foolish. But the theme, the, the theme that runs uh, throughout scriptures, the truth that is presented loudly and clearly over and over in the scriptures, is that God is going to hold all of humanity accountable. Uh, all of humanity in general, but every single human being individually as well. Uh, and He is going to hold us all accountable for how we have lived our lives here on this earth. That is, folks, that is the heart 
and the soul of biblical prophecy. That is what Bible prophecy uh, is especially uh, about. It's uh, the teaching of the Scriptures in books like Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and almost all of the minor prophets uh, in the Old Testament, and yet uh, also powerful books like uh, little short ones like First and Second Thessalonians or Second Peter or Jude in the New Testament. And then, of course, uh, we must remember that incredible book called the Revelation uh, in the New Testament where, where Yahweh Elohim tells us uh, the detailed plan, the detailed plan that he has uh, in mind for the judgment of the entire earth uh, and the consummation of time and history as we know it and how it's all going to, uh, to come to pass according to his plan for eternity. It is a foolish person. It is a foolish person who dismisses Bible prophecy as unimportant, uh, not understandable. Uh, however people decide to dismiss the value of biblical prophecy, uh, it is foolishness. Uh, we're studying in this uh, study of the book of Luke right now, uh, another very, very important piece of Bible prophecy. Uh, the Lord Jesus' uh, kind of uh, major ex extended prophetic discourse and teaching that he gave uh, on the Mount of Olives. He gave this teaching just one day before the end of his public ministry. Uh, it was, during, of course, during his first coming here to earth. So, let's get to our study again of the Olivet Discourse. Uh, Luke's version of it, which is Luke chapter 21. Last week we covered the, uh, the first important section. Uh, on, it's number one on your sermon outline sheet, uh, verses 5 through 7. Uh, I called it just the, the details of the setting of this prophecy and in how it came about, uh, as also the reason it was given. And these are very, very important uh, details. Um, the Lord Jesus uh, himself obviously, knowingly initiated this discussion with his disciples. We know that the uh, discussion mainly took place with uh, four of his disciples, two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, uh, James and John. Uh, and uh, Jesus began it by prophesying the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and especially the temple that was being built there in Jerusalem or rebuilt. I won't retrace that whole discussion. It is a very, very important discussion, though, and if you don't uh, have any kind of relationship to it, I really encourage you to go to our website uh, at truthfellowshiplive.com and listen to that message and follow through uh, with uh, getting an understanding of that setting. By the way, for those of you who uh, are listening by electronic means especially, we've been talking about it here in, at uh, Truth Fellowship Live uh, in place here, but I want you to know who are those of you who are listening via electronic means uh, that we are going to be teaching the book of the Revelation uh, in our seminary uh, starting in actually two weeks from this Thursday. Um, class will be on Thursday evenings. It'll be at 7 o'clock. Uh, if you can attend in person, uh, you can join the class in real time. Uh, we uh, make, uh, make it available via GoToMeeting. Uh, everything in the class, including the video of the lecture, uh, as well as the manuscript of the notes of the lecture are available on the NPBS website. Uh, I have to tell you a little darker side to this whole story. There is a dark side to this story. I got a text this week that there's actually a betting pool that I'm not going to be able to cover it in 12 weeks. Did you know about this? You did know. I know you know. You have to fess up. You actually, you, did you start it? 
No, you didn't start it. Okay. I know nothing. I think it's just awful. Don't you think it's awful that it, it's just terrible? But the thought was, <laughs> if there was sufficient interest, perhaps there'd be a too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you want to sign up for the class, uh, just go to npbsonline.org. That's right, isn't it? NPBS for Northern Plains Biblical Seminary. NPBSonline.org. Or contact John Hansen. He'll, he'll get you signed up too. All right? All right. Uh, Luke 21, 5 through 28. We talked about the setting last week, verses 5 through 7. Pick it up now in number 2 on your sermon outline sheet. I call this the signs that Jesus gave us before the end of the age or the end of the world as we know it. This is verses 8 and 9. So here you have uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John, and they've approached Jesus while they were uh, on the Mount of Olives. Uh, apparently that's where they went to sleep uh, lots of nights. They crossed the Kidron Valley. Those of you who are just in Israel with us, uh, you know what it looks like now. You've got that picture in your mind. Uh, across the Kidron Valley, and uh, on the, uh, the, the west coast or side of the Mount of Olives uh, is the Garden of Gethsemane. Apparently, at that time, the entire uh, western edge of the, uh, the Mount of Olives was, was gardened, uh, not like much of it is now with uh, churches and a huge graveyard and so on. Uh, but... Um, Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus and his disciples often spent the night. And uh, these four men, uh, Jesus' disciples, uh, came to Jesus and asked him three questions. Or they actually, apparently, they must have asked him several questions. Three of the questions they asked are either summarize, summarize all of them or uh, three of the, the ones that are recorded for us by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, Luke actually only records one question. Uh, he only records the first of the questions. Uh, Matthew and Mark record questions number two and three. Uh, but uh, Luke records just the question about the destruction of the temple and what the signs of that are going to be, the city, the destruction of the city. So Jesus now here gives a prophetic answer to these three questions. He starts by answering the third question, the one that Luke doesn't even record uh, him, them having asked him. Uh, that's the, the question that Jesus answers uh, beginning in verse 8, is uh, the question about the signs that are going to uh, uh, portend the end of the, this particular age or the, uh, the uh, end of the world as we know it. Uh, and remember, uh, this is the question Luke doesn't record, but all three Gospels do record Jesus' answer to this third question. Uh, what to expect generally throughout this age that is to come? Now, Jesus is talking here. It's very important that you understand this uh, because if you don't get this point, uh, the Olivet Discourse is not going to make any sense to you. Uh, I struggled with this for years uh, till I understood that Jesus was answering different questions in different Gospels. And, but in this, this particular question, he answers in all three Gospels. Uh, record it. Uh, it's talking about the church age. This period of time that we're living in right now. Now remember, the context here. Context, context, context. It's always important. Jesus was about to die on the cross. Literally, he was going to die on the cross in two days. Uh, then three days later, on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. He would minister for 40 days in his resurrected body here on earth. And then on the 40th day after he was resurrected from the dead, he ascended back into heaven. You know the story, Acts chapter 1. Ten days after he ascended into heaven, the disciples were gathered in Jerusalem like he had instructed them to do, and the church age began. 
the day of Pentecost, um, be, began the church age. Uh, but on the very day that Jesus ascended back into heaven, the disciples didn't even yet understand all, of, all this about this church age, this extended period of time that we are still living in right now. Uh, they asked him, you can check this out, Acts 1-6, just before Jesus ascended back into heaven, uh, are you going to set up your kingdom now? Is it, the, is it the now the time for the end of this age? Uh, that, and they were thinking in terms of the age of the Messiah and the coming new age, they were thinking would be his kingdom on earth. And they were thinking he was going to overthrow the Roman government and uh, set up his kingdom. But they were under a misconception at that time. Um, and uh, later they would know what that meant. But uh, imminency is a word that you need to think about and have in your mind as we study through this. Imminency uh, of the second coming of Christ. They didn't know there was going to be this long period of time between his first and his second coming. Uh, they didn't even know that he was going to ascend back into heaven and be gone from the earth for 2,000 years or so. Uh, but that anyone who understands the Bible, and especially the New Testament, knows that uh, the writers of the New Testament always believed that Christ could come back at any time. Uh, imminency does not mean soon. If you think imminency means soon... You're, you're misunderstanding the word. Imminency means could be at any time. That's what imminency means. doesn't mean tomorrow or in a couple hours or in a couple of weeks. That is not what imminency means. It means could be at any time. And there is a big difference. The disciples did not know about the church age. Um, the clear understanding about the church age came about 25 years later when this guy named Paul, who was formerly named Saul, but uh, he, he was caught up, remember, up into the third heaven. He got this, uh, this revelation that he wasn't allowed to talk much about. Uh, and in the book of Ephesians, he tells us, uh, all about this church age, this, uh, this time when Jews and Gentiles are together in this one body. Uh, and he talks about the mystery of the church. And this church age uh, is understood as uh, uh, all through the, the rest of the New Testament, understood that it's going to end with the rapture of the church uh, and the subsequent second coming of Christ. But that has always been imminent. Could happen at any time. So, here in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is telling his beloved disciples what to expect will take place generally during this period of time. They had no clue how long it was going to be, but Jesus did, of course, know how long it was going to be. So verses 8 and 9, there in your copy of the Bible that you're holding in your hand, whatever copy it is, whether it's a paper copy or an electronic copy. Verses 8 and 9 describe two primary general characteristics of the church age. This is what the church age is going to look like. False messiahs, false teachers, Jesus said, and local wars. Those are the two things that are going to characterize this age that we now call the church age. A um, couple of years, was it two years ago, we studied, we did a whole year of church history. Study the church history. <laughs> two things you constantly read about in church history. You read about uh, movements and people springing up throughout the history of the church, claiming to have the truth, claiming uh, to speak for God, claiming that they are the ones that everyone should listen to. Uh, Islam was born. Buddhism was born. Uh, Shintoism, Hinduism, all of the major false religions of the world were born. Some kind of false messiahship, some kind of major false teaching. Um, but even what is known as Christianity, there have been... Um, through these last 2,000 years, uh, uh, 
incredible numbers of false teachers have arisen. History has spawned constantly false teachers, cults, false teachings of every kind. That has always been the fabric of church history. Jesus was absolutely right. That is what church history is. That is a characteristic of this age in which we're living, and we're still living in it. Uh, and that isn't changing. In almost every case of some kind of false movement or teacher or uh, group that uh, develops, there's some kind of war and violence that's associated with it. Uh, that's also the study of church history. Constant power struggles, constant warfare, constant control uh, in this, the name of this uh, teacher or that teacher or in the name of Christ or whatever. Uh, but Satan's character uh, is, is shown always in these, these groups where everyone who is opposed to God and his word engages in some sort of violent activity to gain power, authority, and keep it once they have it. These two things are absolutely what characterizes church history. Just yesterday, <laughs> Kim Jong-un of North Korea, a wicked dictator, um, you know, announced that they have this imma- massive hydrogen bomb that they're ready now to, uh, to affix to a, a, a ballistic missile and uh, take out the U.S. air bases and uh, bases in Guam. But note this. Note this. Jesus said at the end of verse 9, and this same statement occurs in Mark 24, 6 and Mark 13, 7. Uh, write those two verses down, Mark 24, 6 and Mark 13, 7. All three Gospels record this section, and Jesus made it very clear that seeing these things is simply seeing things that are going to take place. But the end is not yet. You notice that? That's a little marker, and Luke is excellent about telling us as he works his way through this this discourse, as Luke has always done, uh, that he's... uh, that he's saying these things and and he helps us uh, put things in proper order. Do not understand that when you see these things, the rise of false teachers and the rise of false um, movements um, and uh, constant uh, rumors about wars, local wars taking place here and there and everywhere, uh, that uh, these things are not marking the end of the age. And Jesus actually said... No one should be deceived by these things. No one should be uh, captured by it or terrified by it. These two things are just the way this era of time is. Many of these people, many of these movements are quite compelling. People are always drawn, uh, some people are, by false teachers and false teachings. Uh, In fact, if you read and study the pastoral epistles of the New Testament, uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus and, and uh, Philemon, the pastoral epistles of the New Testament, they are absolutely replete with warnings about how important it is for Christians and for churches to stand on the truth of God's Word. Um, and this is something that's virtually lost in uh, American uh, churchdom, Uh, and churches around the world. uh, But standing on solid foundation of of sound doctrine and the truth of God's Word to protect vulnerable Christians from false doctrine. That's the the duty of the church. Jesus said, when you see these things, though, that's not the end. These things do not mark the end of the age. All right? Very important. Now to number three on your sermon outline sheet. Now these are signs of the end of the age. These are signs of the end of the church age. Uh, Verses 10 and 11. Jesus said, There are other signs that you will see that do mark the end of the world as you know it. 
These are things that tell you it's coming. Luke mentions five things that Jesus identified. Matthew and Mark uh, have a little different, uh, slightly different descriptions of this, uh, of what is said in verses 10 and 11 in Luke. Uh, but they're all uh, the same types of things that are going to take place. Here's Luke's list of five things. First, you'll see world war. Second, you'll see earthquakes increase. Famines. Pestilences. And then disturbances, uh, terrifying things, uh, frightening things, so cosmic disturbances, great signs, uh, whatever, however you want to uh, understand that last uh, description. But those five things are what Luke says. Now, you're saying to yourself at this moment, right, where is he getting this world wars thing? It doesn't say world wars. That isn't what it says. Uh, but folks, that is what it says. <laughs> it just says it a little differently. It's probably one of the most important keys to understanding the Olivet Discourse. Notice back in, uh, what is it, verse 9, where Jesus talks about wars and rumors of wars or wars and commotions, and I call that local wars. That's not the same thing as what Jesus describes in verse 10 as nation rising against nation, and kingdom uh, rising or at war with kingdom. Um, wars and rumors of wars is, is just general, and that, that does characterize this whole age. But nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom is actually uh, a specific Hebrew expression. We call it a, and his Hebraism. Um, I won't take you to all of the Old Testament passages that use this Hebraism, but in this context where the whole world is in view, this is clearly world war. Uh, that is how you would understand this expression. Um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, if, if you, uh, you want to follow this through, does an excellent job of tracing through all of the Old Testament passages and, and showing us that nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that is an expression of, uh, of uh, warfare uh, in whatever the context of that region is. It's uh, sometimes also city against city. Uh, but it's a, it's a Hebrew expression. And in this case, the context is the whole world. So uh, Jesus is saying when you see world war the close of the church age, the beginning of the end of the church age, uh, as we call it, uh, is going to draw to a close when you start seeing these world wars. World War I was the first world war. There was never a, a, a world war before World War I. Uh, it changed everything when the whole world went to war. Uh, most historians would agree that World War II was kind of just a, an extension of World War I because whatever the, the world leaders were and what they did after World War I, they certainly didn't solve the problem and it erupted into World War II in just a few years. Uh, so Jesus describes the beginning of the end of the church age as uh, one of the things is world war. Uh, Jesus also described earthquakes, uh, increase in their occurrence and in their apparent intensity, famines, pestilences, and then just other uh, great signs and wonders, some in the heavens, but other terrifying, disturbing, uh, frightening things that are going to take place that are going to mark the end of the church age, the age that we are living in. Well, the 20th century, folks, the 1900s fit that bill. I mean, incredibly. Um, that 100 years of time of history of the church age uh, is, I believe, what Jesus was talking about here, uh, and uh, certainly more than any century in the history of the church, the 1900s were really fit that bill. Now, 
Uh, it's often argued that, well, that's only because there weren't any records kept before that, and uh, so we didn't know that there were earthquakes happening and, and uh, all of that. Um, that simply is an inadequate answer uh, because it's just astounding uh, how much has taken place and how different it, it is uh, once uh, 1900 came onto the scene of history. Uh, I think that that argument that we just weren't keeping records before is uh, is born more of an effort to not recognize and acknowledge that what Jesus said about the close of the age is actually taking place uh, before our very eyes and has been for a while. Brief look at earthquake data. I could I could go on and on and on about this because this is this is absolutely astounding. I'm just going to summarize it for you. But if if you want to f- uh, follow through on this, I encourage you to do that. Just look at the uh, U.S. National Geological Survey or whatever it is that that records earthquakes, and you'll you'll see some stuff that is just incredible, absolutely obvious that both a frequency and intensity of earthquakes has just been crazily increasing. Uh, and, well, it, it, was, it was increasing a little bit up until the 19th century or the 1900s. And then all of a sudden, just boom, it went, went uh, through the roof. 14th century, for example, there were 157 major earthquakes. 15th century, this is 100 years now, uh, 15th century leading up to 1600, uh, 174 major earthquakes. Uh, 1600 to 1700, 16th century, 253 major earthquakes. 17th century, uh, 278 major earthquakes. 18th century, now the numbers start to, to get much higher, 640 major earthquakes. 19th century, 1800 to 1900, 2,119 major earthquakes. 20th century, 1900 to the year 2000. 900,000. <laughs> Is that astounding? Yeah, I, I, I know seismic uh, technology and, and all of that increase. And, and that certainly accounts for some of the increase. I, I, don't, I don't deny that at all. But this is astounding. This is astounding. Did you just hear that there were four earthquakes in Idaho last night? <laughs> yeah, I mean... Fairly good size one, 5.3 or 5 on the Richter scale. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it is just increasing. And it's, it's impossible not to account for the fact that Jesus said, when you see this stuff starting to happen, this, is, this marks the end of the church age. Uh, the same could be said of famines and pestilences. That, uh, and, of, of course, uh, what has taken place, and the reason famine and pestilence is is on on the rise at, at a, a astronomical growth rate, exponential growth, is because people have built larger and larger population centers. People are moving to huge, huge cities, and uh, population centers are gathering, and that's why a, a pestilence, a disease, can can spread like wildfire. Now, of course. Uh, that doesn't change anything as far as what Jesus predicted, though, does it? Uh, he didn't say, well, there's not going to be any population growth uh, and population centers, but there's going to be a great increase in famines. He didn't say it that way. He said there's going to be a great increase in famines, a great increase in pestilences. Uh, and uh, he, he said that as we see this church age coming to a close, these things are going to uh, be taking place. And then as far as these cosmic disturbances and upheaval, uh, you know, there's been a great increase in all of that too. I I haven't really uh, studied that as much, but uh, obviously in the last couple of weeks, folks, we've seen a total eclipse of the sun and and Hurricane Harvey. (laughs) Uh, And that's pretty frightening, pretty big disturbance. 
And I guess Ur Hurricane Irma is coming too. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what that's developing into. But, but folks, the, the point is, I would be terribly remiss if I didn't mention these things and if I didn't also say that the 1900s had a great deal more of, of fulfillment of Bible prophecy that marks the end of history as we know it now uh, that Jesus didn't even enumerate here in the Olivet Discourse. Uh, the, the most prophetically significant set of events in all of the history of the church age is the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. 1948, right in the middle of the, uh, the 1900s. And prophesied over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament. The regathering of the Jewish people to the nation of Israel. And these are, these, you know, people who don't believe the Bible in Bible prophecy say, nation of Israel, that's not significant. Folks, it is biblically one of the most significant things to ever happen in terms of prophecy. The reestablishment, it's never, no nation has ever come back from the dead like the nation of Israel. I think it was Ogden Nash who said, how odd of God to choose the Jews. And, and it, it's so true. God, God has, has restored the nation of Israel. Uh, and they're coming back to the land. Uh, I, I have some wonderful stories about Aliyah, but I'm, I don't have time to tell them. Anyway, uh, not only the, the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, the Jews returning to Israel, but globalization of everything in the world. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense for nations uh, to want to uh, have everything controlled by one central government in, in the world. But that is definitely something that is prophetically significant and taking place right before our very eyes. In fact, every news broadcast you hear in the United States these days uh, about how awful President Trump is, is based on the fact that President Trump wants to make America great again, right? He wants America to ascend to uh, authority and power again like it has once been. But uh, obviously there are powers and forces all over the world, human and spiritual, that want it to be a globalization of the world economy and world government because that's how the end is going to come. And uh, we can see it all the way through. So folks, you have Jesus giving general characteristics of the church age and those things do not indicate that the end of the age is near. But then he gave specific signs that do point to the end of the church age. Matthew and Mark both taught, Luke doesn't mention this, but Matthew and Mark both at the end of describing those characteris characteristics of the end of the church age talk about the beginnings of travail or the birth pang. Now, I have never delivered a child. I want you to know that. <laughs> but I have been present for the birth of all four of our sons. Uh, in other words, Jesus is saying here that when the signs of the end of the age occur, it means labor has begun. Now, we know that labor takes a long time or it might take a very, very short time. Right, ladies? I mean, it, it can go on for a way, way, way long time. Much longer than we want it to. Uh, or it can happen very, very suddenly, very, very quickly. Uh, and, uh, but once we start, once you go into labor, really go into labor, uh, we don't know how long it's going to be, but we know that it's going to end in the delivery of a child. Uh, and that's what Jesus is saying here. The pregnancy is over. Once you see uh, the events of the 1900s taking place, the church age is the beginning of the end, the beginning of labor, and uh, the end is going to happen. And folks, 
We don't know when, but we know that is where we are right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. Timeless truth. We are living in the last of the last days. The travail began in the early part of the 20th century. Labor has been going on now for over 100 years. In only a very short, in only a few short years, the church age will be going to be, will have been going on for, boy, this is a hard sentence to read. In only a few short years, the church age will have been going on for 2,000 years. How much longer will it be? Good question. When will the rapture of the church occur? Could it be today? Absolutely it could be today. Living lesson as I, as I wrote it for the way God spoke to me through this passage, Jesus explained in significant detail to his disciples how the events of the church age will unfold. So the first blank to fill in is detail. The second blank to fill in is how the events of the church age will unfold. Clearly, clearly, folks, we are living in this very unique time in history. I don't know if you think about that very often, but we are living, we are alive in, one, in the most unique time of all of church history. Um, I don't know if Jesus is going to rapture the church in my lifetime here on this earth, but it, the beginning of the end has begun, and the church age uh, is in the process of coming to an end. We are living in a unique time in history. Remember, there will be some generation of people who will experience the consummation of time as we know it. Somebody <laughs> is going to be alive when Jesus fulfills what he promised is going to take place. Are you assured? Are, are, I'm, I'm sorry, it could be us. It could be us. Are you living ready? Are you assured that you have the gift of eternal life? And are you living ready to meet Him face to face? I hope you can answer yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You've given us so much. You've given us such clear teaching about what you are going to do and what's going to take place and how it's all going to uh, come together. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to uh, be the kind of people who live ready, live with a sense of urgency, uh, share our love for you and our faith in you with others, and help us, Lord, uh, to both in word and in deed bring you honor and glory in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, thanks, Pastor Terry, for opening up the Word of God to us, and thank you for joining us. Did you know you can be certain you have eternal life beyond a shadow of a doubt? The Bible says this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. If you'd like to learn more about your life in Christ, please contact me, Pastor John, or one of our staff at truthfellowshiplive.com or call us at 701-751-0103. I'd also like to invite you to consider joining us in worship on Sunday mornings. Fellowship time begins at 10 a.m., followed by our worship service at 1030. Our address again is 1020 South 12th Street, Bismarck. Thanks for tuning in and have a wonderful week.